Oh, well, I was helping her because she was so upset. I took her keys away and I held her down on the bed because I was afraid she would leave and get into a car crash. Well, there may be rare occasions where that's true, but that's a common story that we get from domestic abusers. This might sound familiar to you if you've ever been together with a narcissist, a toxic person, or what Bill Eddy calls a high conflict person. Let's break down this conversation and understand what toxic people are, how you can spot them, how you can avoid them, and lastly, of course, how you can detach from them. And I know narcissist is a new trend word these days. Everybody who is an asshole seems to be a narcissist. But let's forget about that for a second and let's look at the actual numbers. Oh, here's some numbers. First of all, narcissistic personality disorder, they found was about 6% of adults in the United States. Borderline, also about 6%. Then um, antisocial, it's around 4%. Histrionic, it's about 2%. Paranoid, it's about 4% is borderline and narcissist. And it came out around 38% overlap. So, and I teach- People who are borderline also can often be narcissists. Have narcissistic personality disorder. I see. And so this is personality disorder overlap. Now there's a whole continuum here. So many people have traits, but don't have a disorder. Mm -hmm. The current DSM says the total personality disorder is around 10%. Now, that's taking an average of studies from around the world. The study I quoted earlier in the U.S. said 15% have a personality disorder. So roughly between 10 and 15% of people have a personality disorder, with quite a bit of overlap between the different personality disorders. So while people may behave toxic, that does not mean that they are narcissistic, but it does still mean that you should get away and detach from them, or ideally not even get entangled with them in the first place. So how can you spot toxic people? What are some of the signs of a high conflict personality? Um, because in an ideal world, we avoid these people. And again, we're not trying to say that they're bad people. Some of them are bad people, some of them aren't. But is there a question or set of questions one should ask themselves when they are potentially um, dating someone, potentially becoming friends with somebody, potentially becoming co-workers with somebody, and so on. Yeah, so what's interesting is often your gut feeling tells you something's up here. Like the person suddenly has a shocking opinion of somebody else. And they say, you know, that person's a total jerk, and yet you know that person, and they're not a total jerk. They suddenly, something's disproportionate. I think disproportionate mm -hmm. um, emotions is often a trigger. I put, I put in, in a lot of my books now what I call the web method, is pay attention to their words, your emotions, and their behavior. So starting with words, do they use a lot of blaming words? You know, it's all that person's fault. Um, is, are, do they use all or nothing words? They seem to see things through a narrow lens that, you know, there's all good, there's all bad. Um, unmanaged emotions, which they may or may not show, like I explained. Some people are good at hiding all that, even though it drives them inside. And the extreme behaviors. Do they do things 90% of people would never do? Yes, your gut feeling can be a very good advisor. Also, not always. Because especially when you experience toxicity in your childhood, toxic people may feel like home. But the web method, so words, emotions and behaviors, is also a very good approach. Are they always blaming everyone else? Are they showing extreme behaviors? And how are you feeling in relation to that? Now, of course, it's also very important to actually trust your judgment and actually get away from toxic people when they behave like that. And trusting your judgment can be tricky for some, especially when you have deeper subconscious wounds, you start questioning yourself, just as Andrew Huberman says here. I can't help the neuroscientist in me wants to say, like, it's got to be something at the level of the body where we go, wait, that was messed up. Yeah. And, and you can't really point to a specific word. 
And then you start to question yourself. That's the problem. You, you wonder was, well, maybe their tone wasn't, maybe it's my own perception, but I don't know, maybe, maybe the body doesn't lie. Maybe it knows. I think the body is like a first responder mm -hmm. and that we should pay attention to that. And especially with high conflict personalities, especially the con artists, which is part of antisocial personality, and the ones I've dealt with are very good at this, is their words are just right. And your brain is like soothed by them. You go, this person gets it, and I'm totally comfortable, they're charming, all of that. And your gut goes, wait, there's, they're out of sync. I have this cold feeling. Why do I have this cold feeling? And that your guts kind of gets it because they're in a way predatory, like antisocial tend to be predatory. Those people have dead eyes. I've known a few. Yeah. I've known a few, men and women. This mismatch between words and the affect that it creates in us. Yeah. It's sort of like it sounds right, but it doesn't feel right. And right now, you probably recall many, many situations where you experience this. Well, yes, turns out it does not feel right because it is not right because a person is toxic and just says words without actually meaning what they are saying. You have to learn to trust your gut and yourself when this occurs, especially when it happens repeatedly. Another absolutely crucial thing when it comes to dealing with toxic people is that you have to, you absolutely have to set clear boundaries. Because if you don't, they will just walk all over you and use you and abuse you however they want. And the most important part of boundaries are consequences. And this is what most people don't get and most people don't do. If you don't have proper consequences for what happens when someone oversteps your boundaries, you don't actually have a boundary. You just have a wish. Just as Bill Eddy explains in this next clip. Slick is setting limits and imposing consequences. So with high conflict people, you might set the limit. Like you say, you know, I'll give an example as a lawyer. I represent a woman victim of domestic violence. Her ex-husband-to-be didn't have a lawyer. So that means he's allowed to talk to me. I have to talk to him, negotiate, solve problems. So he calls me up and he says, We've got to solve this problem. You tell that blankety blank blank wife of mine. I said, hold on, you can't talk about my client that way. He said, I'll talk about her any way I want to. She's a blankety blank blank or whatever. So he didn't respect my limit at all. So then I said, if you keep talking like that, I'm going to hang up. And so it's up to you. He says, I'll talk about her any way I want. Keeps talking like that. I said, okay, you've chosen for me to hang up. I'm hanging up now, call me when you're ready to be civil. So, end the call. Next morning he calls me back, he says, Mr. Eddie, we have to solve this problem. My blankety blank blank wife, and I say, hang on, remember, I'm gonna hang up if you talk like that. He says, oh no, 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 don't hang up, we have to solve this problem. I'll try not to say those words. And he doesn't say those words, we get to address the problem. So the consequence is what stopped him. So with toxic people, you have to tell them the consequences that are about to happen. He, of course, was in a position of power in the situation because a toxic person needed something from him. But you can put yourself in a position of power as well. How? By not being dependent on the toxic person anymore or being affected by them emotionally, mentally, or otherwise. See, toxic people need control. This is what they thrive on. If you, however, completely disengage and heal and they cannot control you, your reactions, or your emotions anymore, they lose all of their power and you gain the power in the dynamic. How to do that? Well, that goes pretty deep because it often has to do with healing deeper subconscious wounds and traumas within you. But at the end of this video, I will give you a resource that you can go through to work on exactly that. But for now, let's dive deeper into relationships. Are you currently together with a toxic person? If so, we'll talk about that in just a moment. For now, let's talk about how to avoid getting together with toxic people in the first place. And 
if you are in a toxic relationship right now, this is also important for you because you want to make sure that when you get out of your toxic relationship, you don't immediately fall into the next one, which unfortunately is something that happens pretty often. Let's listen to what Andrew Huberman and Bill Eddy say here. The rushing to uh, commit or to create led to more problems than it did good. Yes, and that's many, many of the high conflict divorces that I've worked on as a lawyer and before that as a therapist and sometimes as a mediator are, in my mind, kind of the bad luck stories. Got a decent person, usually my client, of course, but something happened, they got together too fast, and then all this stuff came out. And I really believe in today's world that it, it is a matter of luck. And that's why you should take a year to find out, am I, did I draw the short straw in this relationship because I got this perfect looking person, um, great record, all these good things, but close relationships is where personality disorders come out, interpersonal difficulty, and the high conflict behaviors, mostly close relationships. So they might, everyone might like them at work, but when you're home alone with them, they could be really terrible, yelling, hitting, doing all of this stuff. So that's why we say wait a year. I've, I've had a lot of cases where people tell me, we just, just fell in love, it was beautiful and everything was wonderful for about six months. And then when I committed to get married, all this stuff started showing up, but I got married anyway, because I figured, well, time and love will heal everything, only it didn't. It didn't and it won't. With toxic people, and especially with those who have narcissistic traits, you almost always have a love bombing phase, where the beginning feels absolutely perfect and like everything you ever wanted. But if they call you their soulmate after one or two dates, and want to commit right away, this is a huge red flag. You need time to get to know a person. Just think about it for a second. You want to potentially spend the rest of your life with that person. So take your time to get to know them. And if you end up spending the rest of your life with that person, then where's the rush? Why do you need to rush into a marriage? Don't do that. Get to know them first. Toxic people push for that because like that, they gain control and leverage over you. This also gets very clear in this next clip here. No getting engaged, or for that matter, married. No conceiving children and no moving in together in year one. Are those the critical? Except for the last one is it's really don't commit like getting married within the first year. Sometimes moving in together is a good way to find out what it's like up close with this person. Yeah, you learn a lot by living with somebody. That's right, yeah. that's right. And personality disorders, part of the definition is interpersonal dysfunction. And that's close, that's close relationships. So if you haven't had that close relationship, you don't see what happens when you leave your socks out or the caps off the toothpaste and some little thing is some huge storm. Moving in together is part of getting to know each other. Now, please don't be naive about this. And when you date someone who is toxic, don't think, oh, now I move in with them and everything will be better. No, it will get much worse. Don't do that. But when you date someone and things work well, then yes, you might move in to see, hey, do they still behave good? And if something gets toxic, then this needs to be on your radar. Of course, everybody gets angry once in a while. But the key for toxicity is a pattern of behavior that continues, just as illustrated in this next clip. The key is patterns of behavior. So one thing I want to say is everybody gets angry sometimes. That's, that's fine. Everybody yells sometimes. Everybody, you know, criticizes sometimes. But if they have a pattern, like their life hat pattern of relationship is to yell and scream and criticize and all that, whoa, this pattern is probably going to keep going. So to sum it up, to avoid narcissists and other kinds of toxic people, you want to listen to your gut feelings. Follow the web method. Set clear boundaries, which include consequences. 
Take your time when getting into a relationship. And watch out for behavior patterns that keep repeating. Good, but what can you now do if it's already too late for that and you are already very close to or in a relationship with a narcissist or toxic person? This now is absolutely crucial because in my experience, all of my clients and everybody I talk to do this wrong. So let's listen to this next clip. So first of all, we strongly recommend against the direct hit is don't tell the person, look, you do this, 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 and this, and that's terrible. And I don't want to be, I don't want to work with you. I don't want to be in a relationship with you. I don't want to be close to you because of your behavior. That high conflict people puts them through the roof. They will defend themselves. And for the next months or years, they may put you in litigation. They may uh, stalk you, depending on your relationship. They, they, they will hate you for that. They'll blame you. Don't confront or blame them. You might have an inner urge to do so, but this will not lead to anything good. It will just make things much, much worse. Because toxic and especially narcissistic people will do everything to get back at you for that and to hurt you. So don't do it, even if you really, really want to. But it will only lead to more and more toxicity that you will have to deal with. And this also goes hand in hand with what Bill Eddy says in this next clip. Forget about trying to give the person insight into how they're behaving. That blows up the person. You know, just like I said, don't blame them for you ending the relationship. So just forget about giving them insight. Instead, talk about what we can do now. Talk about options. Talk about don't don't go inward with them, go outward with them. So when you go inward, you escalate their defensiveness. So don't try to give them insight into themselves. And a lot of people say, how can I make him see that what he's doing is so wrong? Or how can I make her understand that she's, she's creating the problem we're trying to solve? Just forget about that. Talk about, okay, here's what our options are. Let's talk about what to do. How can you make him see? How can you make her understand? Well, you can't. That's it. That's the answer. You can't. And if you try to do so, things will only get much, much worse. As Bill Eddy says, go outward, not inward. Now, very important here, all of this is assuming that you can still talk to that person in any kind of way. If you already made the mistakes mentioned before, you cannot talk to them anymore. But for now, let's assume you have not made any of these mistakes. The next thing you want to avoid is to blame yourself. Don't blame yourself because that reinforces to them. Like if you say, you know, I'm so sorry, but I just can't you know, keep up with you. You're such a, a really good this, this, and this, and, and I just can't keep up with that. Well, they're going to blame you for that. So yes, blaming yourself is also a bad thing that you want to avoid. Just avoid blame in general. They will always see that as an attack against them. Now in this next clip, Bill Eddy talks about what, what is left and what you can actually do. Very important, again, this is only assuming that you have not made any of the other mistakes. Well, what's left? <laughs> what's left is we aren't a good fit. Um, our goals have gone in different directions. Um, I'm really ready for a career change. Um, I want to go back to school or, you know, I just realized I'm, I'm not ready for a committed relationship. So it's not about you and it's not about them. It's not about blame. You want to try to keep it away from blame. So yes, again, keep it away from blame. Even if you have an urge to, or if you think, oh, he or she did me so wrong, I have to tell them, don't. Don't do it. It will only make things much, much worse. Unfortunately, most people have to go through all of the pain and toxicity until they hit absolute rock bottom, until they finally move, start changing and healing. I have seen this with my clients numerous of times. I really hope that this is not you. But if you have made some of these mistakes, it's about blame or toxicity is high in your relationship with a toxic person, then sometimes, in my experience, most of the time, the only answer is to get away 
as soon as you possibly can. I want to say there's some times where you just need to get out and do it all at once right. and don't um, ease yourself out. Right. Like, Serious physical or emotional risk. Yes. So you may need to get away before you hint that I no longer want to be married to you. And I've, I've worked with people, consulted with them on established, you know, moving out when the other person isn't there. They and the kids go to a safe place. They've got their lawyer. And then they tell this person that I'm getting divorced from you. In my experience, this is usually the best strategy. Because even if you talk to that person without any blame, they are very, very good at manipulating you and keeping control over you and keeping you around. Even if you've made up your mind and you've spotted the toxicity, the toxic pattern of behavior, and it's very, very bad, they still are very, very good and manipulative in talking you into trying it again, into they will change, and into staying with them. So usually, in my experience, the best thing you can do is to just get away from them, and if you can, go no contact completely. Because otherwise, they'll probably try to either hurt you or lure you back in. And one way they might try to lure you back in is through hoovering. I'm divorcing you and they're like in a rage at you. And then, no, I'm, I'm really leaving. Then they switch and beg and plead. And I've, I've got cases where people say, and, and you know, my ex-to-be just seduced me and somehow I went along with it because it felt real good. And it's back and forth from the high conflict person and they call it hoovering. They suck you back into the relationship. And it's very common with some of the high conflict personalities. They can't stand to lose you and when rage doesn't work, then they try to seduce you back in. And some people have allowed themselves to get back in. And that's, that's not good. You've got to be ready for that. Don't be surprised by that and don't give in to that if you're sure it's over. So yes, be aware of that and ready for that and everything the toxic person might do. But how? How can you be ready? How can you detach and keep yourself from falling back into these toxic relationship patterns? The answer is by healing your deeper subconscious wounds and traumas. And I talk you through exactly how to do that in the video right over here. So if you're committed to get out, to heal, and to not fall into a situation like this again, watch that video, take notes, and I'll see you over there.